Congratulations, spectacular students. This is my last lesson. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being part of my class. You have been incredible, and I've said it a lot of times, you were the best seventh grade I've ever, ever had a chance to teach. I hope you enjoy our last lesson together. This is 12-3 Communities, and our only one essential question, how do populations in a community interact? There's a whole bunch of vocabulary words, but since it is the last lesson, I have already built the concept map for you, and if you keep watching, I might just share it with you at the end. All right, we have habitat, niche or niche. I'm going to pronounce it niche, but you can pronounce it niche. Producers, consumers, symbiosis, mutualism, commensalism, parasitism, detritivore, and food web. All of these words are really pretty simple. A lot are related. But before we dive any further, there's a guy who's a heck of a lot smarter than me who's going to explain it to you. A lot of ideas that we just assume that we know a lot about because we hear about them all the time. For instance, I know what pop music is, but if you were to corner me at a party and say, Hank, what is pop music? I'd be like, it's uh... It's like uh, the music that plays on the pop station. Just because we're familiar with a concept does not mean that we actually understand it. Ecology is kind of the same way, even though it's a common everyday concept. An ecosystem is a word that we hear a lot. I think most of us would be a little stumped if somebody actually asked us what an ecosystem is, or how one works, or why they're important, etc. I find it helps to think of an ecosystem, a collection of living and non-living things interacting in a specific place, as one of those magic eye posters for those of you who were sentient back in 1994. An ecosystem is just a jumble of organisms and weather patterns in geology and other stuff that don't make a lot of sense together until you stare at them long enough from far enough away and then suddenly a picture emerges. And just like with magic eye posters, it helps if you're listening to Jamiroquai while you're doing it. So the discipline of ecosystem ecology, just like other types of ecology we've been exploring lately, looks at a particular level of biological interaction on Earth. But unlike population ecology, which looks at interactions between individuals of one species, or community ecology, which looks at how bunches of living things interact with each other, Ecosystem ecology looks at how energy and materials come into an ecosystem, move around in it, and then get spat back out. In the end, ecosystem ecology is mostly about eating, who's eating whom, and how energy, nutrients, and other materials are getting shuffled around within the system. So today, we're setting the record straight. No more not understanding how an ecosystem works, starting now. <laughs> So ecosystems may be a lot like magic eye posters, but the way that they're not like a magic eye poster is in the way that posters have edges. Ecosystems! I'll just come out and say it, no edge, only fuzzy, ill-defined gradients that bleed into the ecosystems next door. So actually defining an ecosystem can be kind of hard, mostly it depends on what you want to study. Say you're looking at a stream in the mountains. The stream gets very little sunlight because it's so small that the trees on its banks totally cover it with shade. As a result, very few plants or algae live in it, and if there's one thing that we know about planet Earth, it's that plants are king. Without plants, there are no animals. But somehow, there's a whole community of animals living in and around this mountain stream, even though there are few plants in it. So what are the animals doing there, and how are they making their living? From the land, of course, from the ecosystems around it. Because no stream is an island, it isn't there all by itself. All kinds of food and nutrients and other materials drop into the stream from the trees or are washed into it when it rains. Leaves and bugs, you name it, flow down from neighboring terrestrial ecosystems. And that stuff gets eaten by bigger bugs, which get eaten by fish, which in turn are eaten by raccoons and birds and bears. So even though the stream's got its own thing going, going on, without the rest of the watershed, the animals there wouldn't survive. And without the stream, plants would be thirsty and terrestrial animals wouldn't have as many fish to eat. So where does the ecosystem of the stream start and where does it end? This is a perennial problem for ecologists because the way it works, energy and nutrients are imported in from some place, they're absorbed by the residents of an ecosystem and then passed around within it for a little while and then finally passed out, sometimes into another ecosystem. This is most obvious in aquatic systems where little streams eventually join bigger and bigger waterways until they finally reach the ocean. 
this flow is a fundamental property of ecosystems. So at the end of the day, how you define an ecosystem just depends on what you want to know. If you want to know how energy and materials come in, move through, and are pooped out of a knot in a tree that has a very specific community of insects and protists living in it, you can call that an ecosystem. If you want to know how energy and materials are introduced to, used, and expelled by the North Pacific Gyre, you can call that an ecosystem. And if you want to know how energy and materials move around a cardboard box that has a rabbit and a piece of lettuce in it, you can call that an ecosystem. I might tell you that your ecosystem is stupid, but go ahead, do whatever you want. The picture you see in an ecosystem's magic eye is actually dictated by the organisms that live there and how they use what comes into it. An ecosystem can be measured through figuring out things like its biomass, that is the total weight of living things in the ecosystem, and its productivity, how much stuff is produced and how quickly stuff grows back, how good the ecosystem is at retaining stuff, and of course all these parameters matter to neighboring ecosystems as well, because if one ecosystem is really productive, the ones next door are gonna benefit. So, first things first, where do the energy and materials come from? And to be clear, when I talk about materials, I'm talking about water or nutrients like phosphorus or nitrogen or even toxins like mercury or DDT. Let's start out by talking about energy, because nothing lives without energy, and where organisms get their energy tells the story of an ecosystem. You remember physics, right? The laws of conservation state that energy and matter can neither be destroyed or created. They can only get transferred from place to place to place. The same is true of an ecosystem. Organisms in an ecosystem organize themselves into a trophic structure with each organism situating itself in a certain place in the food chain. All of the energy in an ecosystem moves around within this structure, because when I say energy, of course I mean food. For most ecosystems, the primary source of energy is the sun, and the organisms that do most of the conversion of solar energy into chemical energy, you know this one. Who rules the world? The plants rule the world. Autotrophs, like plants, are able to gather up the sun's energy and through photosynthesis make something awesome out of it, little stored packets of chemical energy. So whether it's plants, bacteria, or protists that use photosynthesis, autotrophs are always the linchpin of every ecosystem. The foundation upon which all other organisms in the system get their energy and nutrients. For this reason, ecologists refer to plants as primary producers. Now obviously the way that energy gets transferred from plants to animals is by the animal eating the plant. For this reason, herbivores are known as primary consumers, the first heterotrophs to get their grubby paws on that sweet, sweet energy. After this stage in the trophic structure, the only way to wrestle the solar energy that was in the plants that the herbivore ate is to, you guessed it, eat the herbivore, which carnivores, known as secondary consumers, are very happy to do. And assuming that the ecosystem is big enough and productive enough, there might even be a higher level of carnivore that eats other carnivores, like an owl that eats hawks, and these guys are called tertiary consumers. And then there are the vores that decompose all of the dead animal and plant matter, as well as the animal poop, detritivores. These include earthworms and sea stars and fiddler crabs and dung beetles and fungi and anything else that eats the stuff that none of the rest of us would touch with a three meter pole. So that's a nice hierarchical look at who's getting energy from what or whom within an ecosystem. But of course, organisms within an ecosystem don't usually abide by these rules very closely, which is why these days we usually talk about food webs rather than food chains. A food web takes into consideration that sometimes a fungus is going to be eating nutrients from a dead squirrel, and other times squirrels are gonna be eating the fungi. Sometimes a bear likes to munch on primary producers, blueberry bushes, and other times it's gonna be snacking on secondary consumer, like a salmon. And even at the tippy tippy top, predators get eaten by stuff like bacteria in the end, which might or might not be the same bacteria that eat the top predator's poopies. Circle of life! It's also worth noting that the size and scope of the food web in an ecosystem has a lot to do with things like water and temperature, because water and temperature are what plants like, right? And without plants, there isn't gonna be a whole lot of trophic action going on. Take for example the Sonoran Desert, which we've talked about before. There aren't really any plants there compared to say the Amazon rainforest, so the primary producers are limited by the lack of water, which means that primary consumers are limited by a lack of primary producers. And that leaves precious few secondary consumers, a few snakes, some coyotes, and hawks. All this adds up to the Sonoran not being a terribly productive place, compared to the Amazon at least, so you might only get to the level of tertiary consumer occasionally. Now all this conversation about productivity leads me to another point, about ecosystem efficiency. When I talk about energy getting passed along from one place to another within an ecosystem, I mean that in a general sense. Organisms are sustaining each other, but not in a particularly efficient way. In fact, when energy transfers from one place to another, from a plant to a bunny, or from a bunny to a snake, the vast majority of that energy is lost along the way. So let's take a cricket. That cricket has about one calorie of energy in it. And in order to get that one calorie of energy in it, it had to eat about 
10 calories of lettuce. Where did the other 9 calories go? It is not turned into cricket flesh. Most of it is used just to live, like to power its muscles or run the sodium potassium pumps in its neurons. It's just used up. So only the 1 calorie of the original 10 calories of food is left over as actual cricket stuff. And then, right after his last meal, the cricket jumps into a spider web and is eaten by a spider, who converts only 10% of the cricket's energy into actual spider stuff. And don't get me started on the bird that eats the spider. This is not an efficient world that we live in. But you want to know what's scary efficient? The accumulation of toxins in an ecosystem. Elements like mercury, which are puffed out of the smokestacks of coal-fired power plants, end up getting absorbed in the ocean by green algae and marine plants. While the tiny animal that eats the algae only stores 10% of the energy it got, it keeps 100% of the mercury. So as we move up the chain, each trophic level consumes 10 times more mercury than the last. And that's what we call bioaccumulation. Concentrations get much higher at each trophic level until a human gets a hold of a giant tumor that's at the top of the marine food chain, and none of that mercury has been lost. It's all right there in that delicious tuna flesh. Because organisms only hold on to 10% of the energy they ingest, each trophic level has to eat about 10 times its biomass to sustain itself. And because 100% of that mercury moves up the food chain, that means that it becomes 10 times more concentrated with each trophic level it enters. That's why we need to take the seafood advisory seriously. As somebody who could eat anything you wanted, it's probably safest to eat lower on the food chain. Primary producers or primary consumers, the older, bigger, higher in the food chain, the more toxic it's gonna be. And that's not just my opinion. That's ecosystem ecology. Thank you for watching this episode of Crash Course Ecology, and thank you for everyone who helped us put this episode together. If you want to review any of the topics we went over today, there's a table of contents over there that you can click on. And if you have any questions or comments for us, we're on Facebook or Twitter, or of course, down in the comments below. We'll see you next time. All right, you should now have ecosystem down and you should have a pretty good idea of what a lot of those vocabulary words are. But if you zoned out during the video, don't worry, I'm here for you. Okay, first of all, habitations, oh my. Habitat. The place within an ecosystem where an there organism is. lives is its habitat. A habitat like the one in the image provides all the resources an organism needs, including food and shelter. A habitat also has the right temperature, water, and other conditions for the organism to survive. For example, a rainforest habitat will have tall trees for the birds that live in the canopy, rivers for fish, and soft dirt for insects. Okay, so that's what habitat is, and I apparently recorded that and read it earlier, and it surprised me. But I should know, the little speaker's right there, and probably I'm going to tell you about the next thing, too. The rainforest tree in the image is a habitat for sloths, insects, birds, vines, and many other species. Each species uses the habitat in a different way. A niche or niche, you can pronounce it either way, Told is you. what a species does in its habitat to survive. For example, butterflies feed on flowered nectar, sloths eat leaves, ants eat insects or plants. These species have different niches in the same environment, each organism has its own niche on the tree. The plants anchor themselves to the tree and can capture more sunlight. Termites can use the tree for food. Do you remember what kind of plant anchors itself to the tree and captures its sunlight and moisture? Resurrection fern. Okay, the next thing we're going to take a look at is Producers. Producers are organisms that use an outside source of energy, such as the sun, and produce their own food. Most producers, green plants, algae, and some kinds of bacteria, make energy-rich compounds through photosynthesis. Recall that photosynthesis is the chemical process that uses carbon dioxide, water, and light, and energy, usually from the sun, to produce glucose, a type of sugar, and oxygen. So producers are always going to be the base of any food chain or food web, which is coming up in a minute. And it's really important. The only place where we don't see producers like this is in the deep ocean and hydrothermal vents, where they, instead of having photosynthesis, they have chemosynthesis, and they can survive with a combination of a little bacteria that ends up being the producer. And 
they metabolize a chemical called hydrogen sulfide instead of doing the water sunlight thing we do here on the surface. Really interesting, really different kind of life. Consumers. Organisms that cannot make their own food are consumers. You and I are consumers. As shown above, they obtain energy and nutrients by consuming other organisms or compounds produced by other organisms. You are definitely consumers. I've seen some of you walk into my classroom and decide instead of science time, it's snack time. So you're consuming. Now the word consumer is used in science to mean anything that's going to be consuming another consumer or producer. But in economics, it means a whole other thing, just talking about humans who go out and buy things. And for that way, we're still all consumers. Herbivores eat producers. Herbivores include butterflies, aphids, snails, mice, rabbits, fruit-eating bats, gorillas, and cows. I'm not an herbivore, but it would be better for the environment if I was. Omnivores eat producers and consumers. Omnivores include corals, crickets, ants, bears, raccoons, and humans. Yep, I'm one of those. I like being an omnivore because I have a wide choice of different things to eat. Carnivores eat herbivores, omnivores, and other carnivores. They include scorpions, octopuses, sharks, tuna, frogs, insect-eating bats, moles, and owls. So, if you were organizing your concept map, which you don't have to do because I'm going to do it for you, you could list the three types of consumers, herbivores, omnivores, and carnivores. But these aren't even vocabulary words, even though I think they should be, and they're really important. Detritivores consume the bodies of dead organisms and waste produced by living organisms. <laughs> detritivores eat the dead. They're like zombies. Are zombies detritivores? No, do zombies are eating things that are alive, but they're dead. So they're like reverse detritivores. I'm going to lose sleep thinking about that one. Anyway, if it were not for detritivores, we would be in a lot of trouble because they're kind of the, the cleaners up of all the waste that's left around on the planet. So they're a good thing even if what they're consuming seems very unappealing to us. This is the food web and notice the arrows. The arrows are showing the flow of energy. There's the sun, kind of the source of all the energy. I'm, uh, uh, yeah, use the meter stick, Mr. C. Okay, so there's the sun, and note that the arrow points this way, which means the energy is flowing from the sun to the plant. Food webs are always drawn this way, and it's not just about what is eating what, it's mostly the flow of energy, and in an advanced biology class, you'll actually calculate how much energy. We'll play with it a little bit here, but you'll look at just how much energy goes to each thing and how much energy is lost moving from one organism to another. But you can see with just a few life forms, it can get pretty complicated. Real food webs that include everything are extremely complex. Okay, this is going to help you understand it a little bit better. You didn't expect that, did you? I thought that's a very fun way to understand the food chain or food web and see how things get transferred through a food chain. All right, so we also can look at it in the form of an energy pyramid. And the critical thing to know about the energy pyramid is that every time you jump up a level, you lose 90% of the energy. 
only 10% of the energy keeps making it up. And if you were actually here in the class, I would tell you this amazing story about chickens and cornflakes and, and surviving on an island. But I think we might have done that. Anyway, this tells you that the smart thing to do is eat the chickens first, because they're already using up energy, then the cornflakes, and then hopefully you get rescued. Um, because you can see, we start here with, you may or may not be able to see the 1,000 kilocalories, and eventually this owl ends up with just one kilocalorie of energy. So you lose energy with each step up the chain. So here's a math thing that if you were here in class, I would turn you loose with it and read it to you and say, here's what you're doing. But we don't have time for that because that would take forever in this video and it's not the same as me coming around seeing you and seeing how you're doing it and figuring it out. Um, if you have, by some miracle, gotten to it and you want to pause the video and see if you can figure it out on your own, do that and I will just think you're brilliant. Um, I think you're brilliant anyway. But here's the way it works. You lose, you just move the decimal point one place to the left each time. And so you're losing a significant percentage. And so by the time you get to the third level, it's 330 kilocalories. Where it gets hard is how much energy would the owl use for its life processes or loses heat. And that's 297 kilocalories. Well, where in the world did I get that number? You go one step further and you get 33 and then subtract it from this and that's how you get that. And that is not easy. But if you figure that out on your own, I'm really impressed. And there's the 33. So, complicated to look through the energy. If you're here in the class, I would explain this in a lot of detail. It would make more sense. But for now, all I need you to capture from this is each time a lot of energy gets lost. All right, moving on to relationships in communities. Symbiotic relationships. Some species have such close relationships that they are almost always found living together. A close, long-term relationship between two species that usually involves an exchange of food or energy is called symbiosis. There are three types of symbiosis, mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. Do you see how they put that together for you? I mean, how easy for the concept map. So on your concept map, you would simply write symbiosis underneath it, three types, mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. You probably know what parasitism is, but mutualism and commensalism, you may need me for. Symbiotic relationships. Some species have... Okay, uh, this looks like a bird about to get eaten by an alligator. But it turns out that's not what's going to happen at all. This is a symbiotic relationship. In this case, this is mutualism. Mutualism means both creature benefits. The alligator is benefiting because stuff that's on his teeth that he doesn't want on his teeth is getting cleaned off by the bird. The bird is getting a free meal out of it and that bird is absolutely, positively guaranteed nobody else is going to bother it while it's there eating. So it's a good deal for both of them. All right, so we do have commensalism, mutualism, and parasitism. So let me tell you a little bit about each one. Commensalism, a symbiotic relationship that benefits one species but does not harm or benefit the other is commensalism. Plants called epiphytes, shown in the image, grow on the trunks of trees and other objects. The roots of an epiphyte anchor it to the object. The plant's nutrients are absorbed from the air. They're often called air plants because of that. Epiphytes benefit from attaching to tree trunks by getting more living space and sunlight. The trees are neither helped nor harmed by the plants. Orchids are another example of epiphytes that have commensal relationships with trees. There is even a small orchid that grows in Florida hammocks. And of course, when you and I walked through the maritime hammock, there were gazillions of air plants or epiphytes there, 
but I didn't point them out because they would be unfamiliar and you just would think somebody threw a pineapple up in a tree. They do kind of look like pineapples, uh, but they're really neat plants and there is this wild Florida orchid if you're lucky enough to find it. All right, so commensalism, one thing isn't hurt, one benefits. The other one's just like, eh, whatever. Mutualism. Alligators and birds share a mutualistic partnership as shown in the image. A symbiotic relationship in which both partners benefit is called mutualism. Alligators and plover birds live in a wetlands community. The alligator has many teeth and food often gets trapped between them. The plover bird peck away at the debris in the alligator's mouth. The alligator gets a clean mouth while the bird enjoys a leftover meal kind of serving as dental floss for the alligator. Mutualism is my favorite because both creatures benefit from it. There's a, they, they, it's a win-win situation. Parasitism, a symbiotic relationship that benefits one species and harms the other is parasitism. The species that benefits is the parasite. The species that is harmed is the host. Heartworms, tapeworms, fleas, and lice are parasites that feed on a host organism, such as a human or a dog. The parasites benefit by getting food. The host usually is not killed, but can be weakened. For example, heartworms in a dog can cause the heart to work harder. Eventually, the heart can fail, killing the host. Other common parasites include fungi that cause ringworm and toenail fungus. The fungi that cause these ailments feed on keratin, a protein in skin and nails. I don't like parasites. They are truly my least favorite because they're benefiting and the way they benefit is to harm something else. And so, so these, these creatures that for the most part, almost none of us like, are the parasites. Um, sometimes, well, I don't know if it's a parasite, it's a saprophyte that's destroying on dead stuff. Because fungi uh, or fungi often grow on dead trees, but in that case, they're performing a good service. But if they're growing on a living tree, then they're a parasite. And that gets us to the end of lesson three. Now, there's a couple of videos that will be attached. One that's pretty funny and kind of maybe a little cruel. It's, they don't mean to be cruel, but there's places where prairie dogs live, and the prairie dogs need to be moved because they're gonna do something with that area. And they have a giant prairie dog vacuum. So after the concept map, stay tuned, and I'll hopefully have the prairie dog vacuum for you. Okay, we've made it to the concept map. What I'm planning to do in Google Classroom with this and all the others is I'll put a blank Google slide in there for you and you can build it on the Google slide or you can attach a picture of your own to the Google slide. However, but don't just take a picture of mine and attach that. You'll get a zero for that. You've got to put some work in it. So I started with community and I said community has a habitat, habitat, and then it says what life does in its habitat it survive is what a niche is. Then we said the community has producers, consumers, and detritivores, which are all connected by our dancing food web. And communities have symbiosis with three relationships, mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. And that's your concept map, and that's the end of the book. Okay, and that is the, the closing slide. Congratulations, you finished the book. I appreciate the daylights out of all of you. Thank you for watching my silly video lessons. And I cannot wait till I get to see you live and in person again. Live long and prosper.